Welcome to those who have joined so far. Um, I'm trying to work out the glitches here. Uh, this is the first time I've used YouTube Live. And um, <clears throat> I was under the understanding that I could share my screen with PowerPoint. And I'm having some difficulties doing that. So I'm working that out right now. And should have things going in a minute. Hi, Rocky. Glad you could join. Looks like we have a few people on with us. I'm just trying to get started. Yeah, I'm installing OBS, um, but I installed it and I'm not sure where to go from there. I think YouTube might have recently updated their settings to not allow um i think that may have updated some things Welcome to whoever else has joined us. Sorry, um, we're I'm just working on getting started here. It's first time I've used YouTube Live again, so I'm just trying to get the PowerPoint so that you would be able to see it. That is my plan. Uh, we might have to go without the PowerPoint uh, because I am having trouble getting this set up, unfortunately. Um, so maybe I can send you guys the PowerPoint. <clears throat> And I apologize for that.
Yeah, that'd be great, Keith. <clears throat> Thanks for that. Um, yeah, when I set this up, I was under the impression that I could do it. But the videos I watched, I think, are outdated now because the I think YouTube has recently changed their setting because there's I'm supposed to be able to get a streaming key and I can't get that that I could type into into OBS, but uh, that is not working because right? I don't have a streaming key. So So let's get started and we'll just go without the power without the PowerPoint and I'll send you guys a link to the PowerPoint. Um, so um, we uh, thank you, Rocky and Keith. Thank you guys for being patient with me. Uh, I don't have a PowerPoint. It looks like a couple of people just joined. I don't have the ability to share my screen able to do that but I can't so I'm just going to go ahead and present without the PowerPoint um, and uh, we'll get started we're talking about back to basics um, kind of simple changes that you can make in your lifestyle to improve your um, overall health so we'll go ahead and we'll get started and actually what I'll do is I'll record PowerPoint, that way when I share it, and you can listen. So, um, so uh, we have um, recently been well, we're all, we've all been affected by the recent coronavirus pandemic. And I just wanted to share some statistics with you. Uh, it looks like over 800,000 have been infected with the coronavirus at this point. And there's been over 41,000 deaths. And that's from the Johns Hopkins um, website, most recent up, update. Um, and um, the influenza, uh, is said, according to the World Health Organization, to affect 300 to 600,000 individuals per year uh, globally. Um, and um, recently, so two things, I'm, I'm going to be presenting these, this information for two reasons. One is that um, there are benefits to take care of your health in that it improves your immune function and that can in turn decrease your um, severity of um, your symptoms when you get an infection. And so uh, some things that you can do to sort of boost your immunity and help if you are infected with something um, like coronavirus, um, is uh, for one, mind your stress outbreak. And that's what I'm reading from now, since I'll have to share with you out loud. I don't have the visual, unfortunately, but um, so uh, for minding your stress, they recommend pausing and taking se a few seconds to um, be mindful of your breathing. Um, you know, when you breathe, you wanna breathe through your um, nose and you wanna fill up your stomach when you breathe, most of us are shallow breathers, but you wanna focus on taking deeper breaths and hold, and that's easier said than done, of course. And so um, that might be a, another class for another time, as far as um, maybe a, we could do a live smoking cessation class if that's an interest of anyone's, but um, smoking definitely is a huge, uh, 
um, has a huge impact on your health, uh, in particular, your upper respiratory system, which um, the COVID-19 and um, smoking is definitely something that increases the risk. You want to get plenty of sleep and uh, that's seven to nine hours a night. Trying to avoid screen time near bedtime is important and trying to take some time about 90 minutes before bedtime to uh, wind down before you go to sleep. You want to eat healthy about what that means a little bit today um, and in the next lecture. Um, also, regular physical activity. Get about 30 minutes per day of moderate to vigorous physical activity. Moderate physical activity, a good way to gauge that would be, uh, if you don't have a heart rate monitor, of course, uh, would be your breathing. So you can use your breathing as a gauge. If you're um, talking and you can't complete a full sentence without taking a breath, kind of like that, that means you're at about a moderate intensity. And that's about where you want to be. If you can't really talk at all because you're just so out of breath that you can't get that's probably vigorous um but if you can sing or, or talk without being out of breath at all yet yeah, you're at a a a um low intensity but you want to be moderate to vigorous and also stay connected socially uh, it's important during this time to stay connected because they there's a lot of um it can be a trial to be alone, if, if that's the case in your situation and, and stuck in one place, it can have a profound effect on you mentally. Um, so that's one reason I wanted to bring up these health principles. Um, and another reason is that, um, you know, not to downplay the extent of coronavirus, um, but the overweight and obesity epidemic and it's known now as a pandemic, just as the coronavirus is, um, meaning that it affects, it extensively affects multiple regions globally. Um, overweight and obesity affects and actually is responsible for 2.8 million deaths per year globally. That's compared to the 800,000, or excuse me, the 41,000 deaths we've had for coronavirus and um, the 300,000 to 600,000 deaths per year of flu, even adding those together, um, according to the World Health Organization, obesity and overweight actually um, takes more lives per year, 2.8 million lives per year. So it's something important that we need to talk about um, because 72% uh, of us are overweight or obese, 32% um, um, would be considered overweight and 37% would be considered obese when you break it down. Um, and uh, actually where I am now in, in West Virginia is the most obese state in the country. And so um, something to be mindful of for sure. The health risk of obesity includes type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease and strokes, um, certain types of cancer, sleep apnea, osteoarthritis, fatty liver disease, kidney disease, pregnancy problems um, like high blood sugar, high blood pressure and increased risk of having to um, get a C-section. This is according to the National Institutes of Health, the NIH um, statistics on obesity. So even though there's no vaccine um, for obesity, but there is a simple solution. And that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about four main strategies that you can apply today um, to improve your health. Very simple strategies. Um, the first is water. Second, we're going to talk about sugar. Third, we're going to talk about fiber. And last, we're going to talk about um, breakfast. So let's first talk about water. What does water do? Um, by the way, if you guys have any questions while you're listening, please feel free to um, type it in the chat. Uh, if you've just come on, I noticed a few people just joined. Um, you'll notice that there's no PowerPoint <laughs> and uh, I'm having some difficulty getting the screen share working. And so we are just. Um, 
going improv right now. I'm using the PowerPoint on my screen and I'm just presenting that way and I'll share the file on my Facebook page. Um, and I'll put a link in the YouTube channel to my Facebook page so that you can access that and get onto the, um, get access to the presentation. Um, and I apologize for that. I thought I planned accordingly, but you never know what's going to happen. So, uh, so um, I apologize for that. Here's a link to my Facebook page if you don't already have it. And then I'll be posting the PowerPoint on there. So what does water do? Actually, water does a lot. We underestimate the power of water. Um, according to Harvard, um, water carries nutrients and oxygen to cells. Um, I mean, it's the medium for all the chemical reactions in your body. Um, you know, blood is made up of a lot of water, so uh, it carries um, a lot of the nutrients and things uh, to the rest of the tissues in your body. Also, it flushes bacteria from your bladder. It aids in digestion, prevents constipation, uh, normalizes blood pressure, stabilizes heartbeat, uh, cushions joints, protects organs and tissues, regulates body temperature, and maintains electrolyte balance. So water does a lot of things in our system, and we're made up of 50 to 80 percent water. So our bodies are, are 50 to 80 percent water. Um, when you think about that, that's actually incredible. No wonder we need to drink so much water every day. Um, and speaking of that, how much water do we need per day? Um, there is uh, varying recommendations, of course. Uh, we've heard eight glasses a day. Um, uh, Harvard recommends four to six cups per day. But um, the recommendations for water vary on the region you're in, because if you're in a hot region or um, a region where uh, you would be sweating a lot, you're actually losing a lot more water. It depends on your lifestyle and it depends on um, your genetics, because if you happen to be a very uh, profuse sweater um, and there are differences between individuals in how much they sweat, then you're going to need more water. And so really the age old best way to tell if you have enough water is the urine test. When you go to the restroom, um, for the most part, unless you're taking a type of medication that affects the color of your urine or you're eating foods, that's, there's certain foods that can affect the color of your urine like beets. And um, if you are um, taking a lot of vitamins or are, are eating something called nutritional yeast, that can affect the color of your urine. Um, but in general, if your urine's clear, it means you're getting enough water. Um, and that seems to hold true as a good test and, and method for checking if you have enough water. Interesting study that was done showed, um, published in the uh, journal Obesity, uh, showed that drinking greater than one liter of water per day in women led to five pounds weight loss in 12 months. And that was independent of other factors. So they controlled for other factors like caloric intake, physical activity, and sociodemographic variables. So they accounted for all of those things. And yet drinking about a little bit more than, or I'm sorry, greater than or equal to one liter of water per day was associated with five pounds of weight loss in 12 months without doing anything else. So um, that's something that, um, uh, you know, you can uh, try to do. Incorporate, if you're trying to lose weight, try to drink more water. Um, what if you don't like water? Well, try adding a twist of fruit. That's one way. Um, and um, flavoring it in some way that can help you it is if that's going to help you get more fluid intake, that's maybe that's what you need to do. Um, of course, you want to, a lot of these flavorings include um, artificial sweeteners and, and preservatives sometimes or different chemicals or colorings. Um, but, um, uh, um, you know, it's, it's somewhere to start at least. Um, another helpful tip, I don't have any research to back this up, but it seems to work and it's a recommendation I give and also use myself is uh, two mugs of hot water in the morning um, 
And even if you add a twist of lemon to that, it's even more um, uh, um, potent as a um, basically keeps you regular. <laughs> so, uh, and the thought is that it would uh, vasodilate um, the blood vessels that go to your intestine and help your gut, help the blood flow to your gut, uh, especially in the morning when you first wake up. Uh, it helps you wake up really and, and uh, keeps you regular. And also another helpful tip is to carry a water bottle with you throughout the day. That'll help you to get um, enough water throughout the day. And as I'm talking about water, uh, my throat is dry, so I'm going to drink some water myself. Um, okay, let's talk a little bit about sugar um, and um, sugar intake uh, is, um, and I'm really sorry I don't have the slides. It would be so much more helpful if uh, we had, if I was able to show you guys the slides and, and have the visual aid with, with that. Next time I'm going to work really hard to get those for you and I'm going to send those out. Um, so I apologize, but uh, just didn't work out. Um, as far as sugar goes, um, how much added sugar do you guys think the average American is consuming per day? Um, how much sugar is the average American consuming per day? According to the um, USDA, we actually consume an average of about 34 teaspoons of added sugar a day. So that's not talking about sugar that's naturally found in fruits and, and other foods, even vegetables have sugar, excuse me. Um, so 34 teaspoons a day. And how much do you think that adds up to per year? Actually adds up to 100 pounds of sugar per year. I mean, that's that's a profound, that's a lot of sugar. 100 pounds of sugar per year, the average American consumes. Um, and I did a little bit of extrapolation here to calculate how many extra calories that would be per day. Because um, if we calculate how many calories that is per day and then add that up over the course of a year, we could figure out how many pounds of weight loss you could have by just eliminating that kind of sugar. Um, so let's let's calculate here how many extra calories per day would 34 teaspoons of sugar be? Well, it turns out there's about four grams of sugar per teaspoon. And um, that turns out 34 times four, um, 34 teaspoons times four equals 136 grams of sugar. Now there's four calories per gram of carbohydrates. Um, and so in sugar, there's four calories per gram. Multiply that by 136 grams, that equals 544 extra calories per day. That's a lot of calories. And over the course, um, well, let me ask you this. 500 cal, do you know how many calories there are in a pound? How many, how much, how many calories you would have to burn to lose a pound of weight? It actually comes out to 3,500. Um, calories. And so um, basically, if you're having 544 extra calories per day times seven, that equals about a pound a week. So you'd be actually gaining about a pound a week. Um, now, the other statistics from the USDA that I quoted from was that the average American consumes 100 pounds of added sugar per year. Now, when you do that calculation, find out that there's 454 grams of sugar in a pound. That equals 45,400 grams of sugar. And at four calories per gram, that's 181,600 extra calories per year. You know how many pounds that is? If you divide that by 3,500 calories, you get 52 extra pounds per year. So you could actually potentially, now this is just an extrapolation. Uh, so it's potentially not completely accurate, but it's an estimate. And the point is 
is that if you eliminate, and it's very hard to eliminate completely, but if you did a good job of cutting back on added sugars, you could potentially lose a lot of weight um, or at least prevent yourself from gaining weight Um, because 52 extra pounds per year just by eliminating added sugar, that's a lot. Um, Particularly, one of the greatest sources of added sugar um, for us seems to be soda. Um, According to Harvard, there's about 10 teaspoons of sugar in um, in a can of soda, that's 40 grams of sugar, and that's about 160 calories. And that those are empty calories. And what I mean by that is, when you look at foods, uh, you'll hear the term sometimes calorie dense versus nutrient dense. And when you look at something like soda, it's a calorie dense food. In other words, it's got a lot of calories, but it doesn't have a lot of nutrients. When you look at something like fruit or vegetables, they don't have so many calories, um, but yet they have a lot more nutrients, vitamins, minerals, antioxidants. They have fiber um, and other healthy components. Speaking of fiber, let's transition and start to talk a little bit about fiber. Um, hope you're staying with me. If anyone's joined, uh, I see some have left and I apologize uh, if it's due to the fact that there's no visual aid, but um, thank you for those who are are here and uh, sticking it out to the end with me here. Uh, if you have any questions while you're listening, please uh, put them in the chat and I'll, I'll get to those at the end. Um, okay, so let's talk about fiber. Uh, there's two types of fiber, soluble versus insoluble. Basically, The difference is soluble means that it dissolves in water uh, and forms a gel uh, versus insoluble, meaning that it doesn't dissolve in water. Um, And um, the fiber tends to add bulk to your stool and uh, keeps you something that keeps you regular, just like water does, um, and uh, um, prevents um, colon cancer. And we'll talk about some of the health benefits uh, here. Um, specifically from the um, journal Nutrients, uh, studies have found that fiber is beneficial for, one, the treatment and uh, prevention of obesity, um, two, the treatment and prevention of diabetes, uh, three, there's they've actually found a dose response, meaning the more you have, the less your risk of cancer. Um, Four, there is a a reduced risk of coronary, of um, uh, um, of um, uh, heart disease, and also uh, it helps you to feel fuller longer. And so, uh, all of these benefits of fiber, and there's actually many more, um, um, are some reasons why it's important for us to get enough fiber in our diets. Now, um, there has been some recent um, interesting research, uh, particularly in 2015 in the American Journal of Epidemiology, there was a study published which showed and demonstrated that for every 10 gram increase in fiber intake, there's a 10% reduction in all-cause mortality. So just by adding 10 grams of fiber to your diet, you're reducing your risk of all-cause mortality by 10%. Uh, Also, men who added another study um, published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition showed that men who added a single apple to their diet um, over the course of eight years gained 1.5 pounds less um, than the others. And so that's just one simple thing. Uh, in a study that they found. And um, I think it's profound because all of the other factors were held constant. And so just by eating an apple a day, not changing anything else, um, you could potentially prevent weight gain. Not that terribly large amount of weight gain, but still it means something, 1.5 pounds over the course of eight years. Um, In that same study, they found that for every 20 gram per day increment increase in cereal fiber, 
weight gain was reduced. Um, so some simple things, just increasing fiber can help reduce weight gain or help prevent weight gain. Um, now, as far as recommended intake, the um, Institute of Medicine recommends 19 to 38 grams per day. And how many do you think um, meet those guidelines? Actually, only about 5% uh, of the population meets the recommended intake of fiber. And so that's pretty pathetic because most of us are not eating enough fruits and vegetables. We'll discover next time uh, some very profound uh, statistics about the risk of uh, not getting enough fruits and vegetables in our diet. So let's talk about one source of fiber, whole grain. We're gonna talk about more about carbohydrates next and, and diet fads and, and, and kind of um, uh, what we should be aiming toward when we, when we uh, more specifics next time. But this time I do want to mention that there's a lot of carbohydrates get a lot of kind of a bad rap. Uh, you know, most of the time you talk to someone, what are you doing to lose weight? Oh, I'm cutting my carbs. Um, well, uh, that's okay, but you need to understand that there's different types of carbohydrates. So there's there's whole grains and there's refined grain products. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about what that means now. And uh, then next time we'll get more into um, the uh, details about that. But, um, and again, I wish I had the visual aid with the, the PowerPoint that you guys would be able to see it. I'm looking at it right now, um, but and I'm sorry that you're not able to see that I'm wondering if I can post pictures in the chat. No, I don't think I can. But um, so um, if you look at a grain, um, if you look at it, there's different components. And one of the reasons why they started making white bread is because um, there is an increased shelf life uh, and it's less expensive. Um, and other factors as well, uh, but um, that increased shelf life mainly um, was a big component. And what they do is they take out a lot of the components. So in a normal wheat grain, there's the hull, the bran, the endosperm, and the germ. Excuse me. So there's different components. Now, the endosperm has mostly just carbohydrates and proteins and a small amount of nutrients. That is the part that's mostly in um, the white bread, but the the germ has been taken out, the bran, and that's where all the fiber is. And, and then after they take it out, they add nutrients back into it. Um, but it's not the same because you're not getting the the food, the whole food in its natural state, um, and uh, especially in particular that fiber, because that is what, as we've learned is so important for our health and most Americans are not meeting even near the recommendations of fiber intake. So I wanna compare the cost of something right now. Um, so uh, again, I wish I had picture, the visual aid here, but um, so let's compare Lay's potato chips. At Walmart, Lay's potato chips, uh, a bag of potato chips, eight ounce bag, costs 268. If you look, um, and in that bag, sorry, in that bag of potato chips, there's only one gram, one gram of fiber, and it's 160 calories. 90 of those calories are from fat. Let's, let's look at an apple. Um, if you look at an apple, it's got five grams of fiber compared to the one gram that's in those potato chips, and it has 116 calories in it compared to the 160 calories in that eight ounce of potato chips. But the weight is of the apple is 223 grams compared to 28.4 grams of the chips. So you're getting significantly more food actually, um, but yet you're getting less calories. And that's the fiber and water content that's naturally occurring in fruits. Um, and then when you compare the price, 
you can actually buy a three pound bag of Gala apples at Walmart for $2.54 compared to the one eight ounce bag of Lay's potato chips for $2.68 at Walmart. So you can actually get a whole bag of Gala apples for less than you can a small eight ounce bag of potato chips. Now, I don't know about you, but I actually would probably, I would prefer to have an apple over a bag of potato chips, but that's just me. Um, but the point is that, um, you know, a lot of people say it's so expensive to eat healthy and it can be, but if you make the right choices and you do it right and you're smart about it, actually you can, um, save money. Um, so, uh, um, yeah, and I didn't make that comment to mean that I think I'm any better than anybody else because I like apples more than potato chips, but, <laughs> but, uh, I do, um, just to be honest. Um, so, uh, looking at, um, the next slide here, um, and I'm going to post the slide if anybody, the slides, um, if anybody's just come on recently, I was not able to live stream the PowerPoint. So I'm just, uh, improv right now. Um, but, uh, um, thank you for those who are on and supporting still. I appreciate that. Um, so, uh, this next slide is a visual, but on it, it shows uh, pictures of stomachs, basically. And it's showing the comparison in caloric density of different foods. It's showing um, 500 calories of that particular food. When you look at 500 calories of oil compared to 500 calories of um, different foods, it's showing how the foods that are higher in fiber 500 calories of those high fiber foods will fill up your stomach. 500 calories of oil only takes up about that much of your stomach. Um, if you um, just uh, for your information, there's nine calories per gram of fat um, compared to um, carbohydrates. There's four calories per gram. So this picture, this visual aid just kind of shows the difference. Oil takes up a little bit of your stomach. Cheese will take up a little bit more. Then you have meat, um, a little bit more. Then you have potatoes, rice and beans, basically the whole thing. And then vegetables and fruits would take up the whole stomach, 500 calories of fruits and vegetables. This would really be helpful if we had the visual again, but um, uh, that's all right. Um, I'll just try to explain it the best I can. If you look at a nutrition label, and you are looking at fiber. We're talking about fiber today specifically. And next, um, or actually on Thursday, I'll be talking more specifics about how to read labels and interpret labels. But um, just looking at one component now of labels, particularly fiber, when you read a nutrition facts label, you want to buy foods First of all, you want to buy foods that don't have the labels on them, actually. And what I mean by that is when you go to the produce aisle, some of those foods have labels, but most of them don't. And those are actually some of the best foods you can get. Um, and so it's important to do that. But if you do buy foods, you know, we all buy foods that have labels for the most part. And so when you do do that, look at the label and try to get a, you want to look at the ratio of carbohydrates to fiber. Um, this is one thing you can look at for, for fiber. When we're talking about fiber, you want it, the ratio of carbohydrate to fiber to be five or less. And so um, what that means is look at total carbohydrates. You'll see on the, on the label. And again, I'm explaining this without the visual aid because I wasn't able to get that on. But um, uh, if you look at a label, grab something from your pantry, maybe if you're if you're nearby um, and just look at a label, but it'll say total carbohydrates and you'll then look at under that, it'll list dietary fiber and sugar. You want the ratio of carbohydrates to dietary fiber to be less than five, ideally. Um, and so um, that's what you want to do. You divide the total carbohydrates by the dietary fiber, and that's how you get the ratio. And 
And um, Raelle has commented here, she says, I ate an apple for breakfast one morning and I was full for the majority of the day. The next day I ate a not so good breakfast and I was hungry in about an hour. So she tested my facts, she says. Thanks, Raelle, for doing that. <laughs> um, and I totally agree, I've tested it as well. Um, so um, when we're looking at some specific foods, we'll look at broccoli. Uh, it's got four grams of carbohydrates, two, you divide four by two, you get two, and that's less than, than five. So that's a good food. Look at whole grain um, uh, noodles. Uh, you divide the carbohydrates, uh, 41 grams, divided by six grams of fiber, and you get 6.8. So that's actually um, a little bit higher than five. And the reason pointed out in this picture uh, is that the the spirilla, um, barilla, however you pronounce it, uh, whole grain in particular, uh, pasta, it's only, see, to be, to have um, the label say um, whole grain, it has to be at least, I think, 50% whole grain. And this particular pasta is 51% whole grain. So that's why there's not as much fiber in it. And that's why the ratio is not exactly uh, less than five. It's not terrible, but it's not less than five. It'd be better than getting, it'd be a better alternative than using the white macaroni or the white refined grain, um, but it's still not ideal. Um, so um, I have a quick reference fiber check um, checker, which you can't see, <laughs> but uh, uh, something that I'll post so that you can access. And if you look earlier in the chat, I posted a link to my Facebook page. Um, that way you can access the chat. And, um, or I mean the, the um, files when I post them, hopefully I can get them up there for you guys. Okay, so um, just a couple more things to talk about fiber, and then we're gonna finish up with breakfast and then we'll be finished. Uh, so thanks for hanging in so far, guys. Um, and, uh, this is another visual, of course, so it's hard for me to share, but I'll explain. If you look at, there's something called the full plate diet. Um, and, and, um, I'm not, I, uh, I'm not necessarily condoning one type of diet over the other. I'm just getting, grabbing from different resources and pulling them together. Uh, the type of diet that I, I recommend aiming toward is a whole food plant-based uh, low-fat diet. Um, so because um, I believe that would be the most sustainable. It's also been shown in the research to um, um, prevent, treat, and even reverse some chronic lifestyle diseases. So that's why I recommend that. Um, but uh, here we're looking at this full plant diet book here and they give some really helpful examples for how to get more fiber in normal everyday foods that you eat every day. For uh, this first slide is showing a picture of cereal, Cheerios, and with milk and it's three grams of fiber. Now if you wanted to fiber that up, you could add some uh, blackberries and that would add I think it says eight grams. Yeah, eight grams of fiber um, to that three. Um, and then if you add a cereal that's higher in fiber, like this, in this particular example, it's Kashi Go Lean. It doesn't have to be that one, but that's the one they used. And that adds 10 grams. So that makes it 18 grams of fiber to get all together. That makes normal Cheerios from three grams to 18 grams of fiber just by adding that fruit and that whole grain cereal. Now let's look at tomato soup. Um, just one cup of tomato soup has two grams of fiber. If you were to add, uh, let's say barley and some frozen vegetables or fresh vegetables, if you wanted a half a cup, you could make that soup into basically a meal and you go from two grams of fiber to nine grams of fiber. If you have a peanut butter and jelly sandwich, let's say on um, white bread. Now, actually, here here's a good example. So this example actually is showing brown bread, but the bread is not whole grain. So they trick you. <laughs> so when you look at the ingredients on bread, you want to check and, and see 
when you read the ingredients, the first ingredient should be whole grain wheat flour or whatever type of flour they use. And if you look in the first couple ingredients are, you know, maybe it's whole grain, but then it says enriched, you know, wheat flour, that would be refined. Uh, and so it's not going to be as high in fiber. It's not going to be as um, whole food, um, excuse me, for you. So it won't be as um, healthful for you because you're not getting as much fiber in there. And uh, so this is a good example. It's it's brown bread. So there might be some whole grain in there, but probably the first ingredient in that bread is white flour, rich, unbleached or whatever they call it, flour. Um, and um, so when you look at it, it's only two grams of fiber for this peanut butter and jelly sandwich with brown, but not whole grain bread. Now, if you look at whole grain bread with, well, this is, they use double fiber whole grain bread. So that's a uh, fiber overload, but uh, that is 12 grams of fiber for two slices. And then you get crunchy peanut butter, two tablespoons, three um, grams of fiber, and then a banana they put instead of the jelly. And then you get 18 grams of fiber compared to the two in just the normal peanut butter jelly sandwich. If you have oatmeal, you can add fruit. Oatmeal's already got. Um, um, uh, fiber in it. Um, and I think uh, Rocky mentioned that he uh, usually eats fruit and oatmeal for breakfast and then bean soup and vegetables for dinner, which is great. He's getting some fiber in there. Um, so yeah, if you wanted, you can make your oatmeal even higher in fiber and even, um, you know, fill you up more. Uh, changes, if you just add sliced almonds and apples, you can take it from four grams to 12 grams of fiber. If you um, wanted a baked potato, um, you know, of course, uh, when you look at carbohydrates, you want to think about the glycemic index, uh, which is a measure of the effect that that particular food has on your blood sugar levels once you eat it. And so if you look at a, um, the way that you cook a potato also affects the glycemic index. So if you had, a potato and you cooked it dry, it actually would have a higher glycemic than index than if you cooked it like steamed or um, boiled. And a higher glycemic index means that it'll spike your blood sugars up higher um, faster and then um, bring them down lower faster. Whereas a lower glycemic index food will keep it more stable, your blood sugar levels. And that's what you want. And now when you're comparing to potatoes, a sweet potato would have a lower glycemic index. So it would probably be a better choice in, when speaking about glycemic index. Um, but even just a regular white baked potato uh, has four grams of fiber. And then if you wanted to, you could load it up and add beans to it. Add um, chili beans, a cup of chili beans, and you bring that up to 17 grams of fiber. So that's gonna not that's not gonna spike your blood sugar like um, um, you know, something simple like uh, um, white bread wood or something that's refined, more refined wood. Now let's talk and finish up by uh, just reviewing or talking a little bit about breakfast. So, um, you know, people say that we need to eat breakfast all the time. And actually the research is confirming that that's true. In a very, very interesting article on obesity, there was um, a um, study done looking at women and they um, put them in two groups. And the groups, um, after tw they went 12 weeks on these two separate diets. And what they did was the first diet was called the dinner diet. And then the other one was the breakfast diet. The dinner diet, they had 200 calories for breakfast, 500 calories for lunch, and 700 calories for dinner. So 200, 500, 700. And then the breakfast had 700 calories for breakfast, 500 calories for, for lunch, and then 200 calories for dinner. So um, in both groups, lunch was 500 calories. But the difference was that 
in the dinner diet, dinner was more calories versus the breakfast diet, breakfast was more calories. They both consumed the same amount of calories, 1400 calories per day. So it was designed as a weight loss study. They both lost weight. But even though they were consuming the same amount of calories, what's so interesting to me is that after 12 weeks of doing this, the women who consumed um, the dinner diet, in other words, more calories at dinner time, they lost less weight than the other group. They had less loss of waist circumference. Their triglycerides increased by 14.6%. And they had higher hunger levels and higher um, ghrelin levels, which is the hunger hormone. Um, the breakfast diet. Let's look at the breakfast diet now. The breakfast diet group was had two and a half times greater weight loss than the other group. They were consuming the same amount of calories. <laughs> it's unbelievable. And then they had a greater loss in waist circumference. And remember the dinner group, their triglycerides increased 14.6%. In this breakfast group, their triglycerides decreased by 33.6%. And they had lower levels of ghrelin, the hunger hormone. So I think that's a profound study showing the benefits of eating a just eating a bigger breakfast. It's very simple. Um, another study in um, Public Health Nutrition Journal found that um, breakfast skipping is associated with up to 20% increase in the risk of type 2 diabetes. So I think that's very profound. And, and our bodies actually function in rhythms, 24-hour rhythms. And they found that our control of um, eating foods later at night is actually not as good. So our response, our blood sugar response um, is worse later in the, in the day um, we go. If we consume a meal later in the day, the response is actually um, not as good. Um, so thinking you'll skip breakfast, think again. <laughs> Um, so, um, we talked about some of these things and I think I'll just give a brief summary and wrap it up and then answer your questions if you have any. Um, first of all, my recommendations from this lecture, uh, are very simple, you know, and we saw from the research that I shared that these simple changes can actually lead to weight loss. So if you're trying to lose weight, doing these things would be beneficial. The first thing uh, that one study uh, showed weight loss when they drank greater than or equal to one liter of water per day. Um, so I recommend increasing your water intake. Um, second, cut out the sodas. We found that 54, I think it was 54 pounds of weight gain per year. If you consume the average, 52 it was, average um, the average sugar intake for added sugar intake, the average American has is 100 pounds per year. So if you, and a big part of that is sodas. So if you just cut out your soda drink, you're on the road to weight loss. Um, eating an apple a day. Um, in other words, just eating more fiber. Eating, one recommendation I have is eating your fruits and vegetables first with your meal. That way you'll fill up on those higher fiber, higher water content foods first, and you won't eat as much as the other stuff. So I don't even, when you're just starting off, you're trying to eat healthier, trying to get healthier, trying to lose weight, whatever it might be. Um, try to do these things first, just make these simple changes. Um, and you wouldn't even have to change anything else initially. Just make these simple changes. The last thing is eating a big breakfast. Um, and that is, is, it sounds like a simple recommendation, but yet it actually is a, could be a challenge because that actually would mean maybe modifying your entire schedule because the way that we function in America is we eat our biggest meal for dinner. Um, and so it can be a challenge for some to do that. Um, but I still recommend aiming towards doing that as much as you can and eating less for dinner and more for breakfast uh, because the research is just showing that that's um, going to be so much better for your health 
and for weight loss. If you do eat more for breakfast, you'll feel fuller longer and you'll be less likely to eat more throughout the day and um, you'll be more likely to lose weight and have better health. So drink more water, cut the sodas and sugary um, drinks, um, start eating more fruits and vegetables and eat a big breakfast. Those are my recommendations. Now, my task to you now is um, for you to be proactive and to set up a um, list of goals. So some things that stood out to you from the presentation, now's the time to do it, don't wait. Um, so grab a piece of paper. Yes, I'm making you do this right now. Um, and write down what your goals are. Uh, if this is something that you in particular know that there's something you need to change, it's good to write down your goals because you'll be more likely to accomplish those goals and your goals should be SMART. And what do I mean by that? They should be, it's an acronym, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time sensitive. So make sure your goals are SMART, specific, measurable, attainable, relevant, and time sensitive. So not just, yeah, I'm gonna eat better. Yes, I'm going to eat fruits and vegetables first at every meal. So you're specific, it's, um, me well, maybe it's not measurable. Maybe you could say I'm gonna eat, you know, two pieces of um, fruit, you know, or two pieces of vegetable before I eat my meal. Um, and uh, make it attainable, something that you know you can actually apply and do. Um, and that would be, our goal would be relevant. So if it's that, and it would be time sensitive. So you say, I'm gonna do this starting tomorrow. Um, so something like that, that's just an example. Um, but just do that. And, um, and um, uh, I think you'll be on the road to success. So next time, I'm hoping and praying that we will be able to have the screen share feature working. Um, and that way, I would uh, be able to share with you the presentation next time. So either way, I'm, I'm planning to share with you the presentation on my Facebook page, which I'll post again a link to that on here so that you can um, get onto my Facebook page and access the PowerPoint in case you wanted it. Feel free to share it with whoever you like. Feel free to share this video. Um, does anybody have any questions while um, we finish up and wrap things up here? Again, I thank you all for coming and sticking it out with me here without the presentation. I know it was kind of rough not having a visual aid, um, but we may do, and I'm glad you stuck it out. And even if you don't have questions now, you can always ask me later if you think of them. So. Okay, so Brittany is asking, would you recommend a drink in the morning as an alternative to coffee? Um, I don't know if you were here initially in the beginning. Um, it sounds really strange, but I would recommend hot water in the morning. Um, so um, that would keep you regular. Um, and also it would help you to um, kind of wake up even, believe it or not. Um, you can add a twist of lemon to that. And if that doesn't do it for you, there are alternatives to coffee. Uh, in particular, there, there's one called Roma. Um, and um, I think they are usually like dandelion root or um, I forget what they actually use. Um, but I'm looking it up right now. I'll send a link to you. Uh, some people use Roma, I think, and some people use uh, carob. Some people use carob. It's sort of like a chocolate substitute powder. Um, so that's something you can try. Uh, this is a link. I don't, obviously, I don't have any affiliation with this website I just sent you, but um, I just happened to look it up and find it just so I could send you a picture of what Roma is. Um, 
And uh, looks like it is, see if they have the ingredients listed. Oh, it's barley. So they use uh, roasted barley to make that roasted chicory and roasted rye. So they're roasted grains. They roast them. Um, and there was another alternative somebody told me about that tastes just like coffee, but it's not caffeinated. I forget what it's called. Um, hope that is helpful. By the way, um, uh, my background, I am. Uh, have a master's degree in exercise science and I'm currently in medical school and I should just make a disclaimer that, you know, the statements that I make here are not reflective of my medical school or anything like that. And, and you should always consult your doctor, um, you know, before you, um, you know, make changes to your lifestyle. So um, just because I'm live, I know that that's something that needs to be put out there, but um, just be wise with what you're doing. Um, Keith says, what would you tell a night shift worker pertaining to meals? That's a really good question. And, uh, I think it's a challenge for, um, for people to do night work. And, um, I did have it see an interesting recommendation for that at one point. Um, but I forget what it was. I think as far as timing of meals, if you're consistently on night work, if you're consistently on night shifts, I would recommend having just regular meals. I think adjusting to the regular meals would be important versus um, kind of being sporadic uh, because that's never good for your digestive system because your digestive system really works with your diet, with your um, circadian rhythm. And so if you are sporadic with your meal times. Your your stomach's not going to be preparing for the next meal. It's not going to be ready for the next meal before you start start eating. I don't know if that helps, but I think for someone that's working the night shift, I would say try to do the same things that anyone else would do. Prepare your meals in advance, um, and you know try to do things that way, uh, and. Um, yeah, I guess, I guess related to whether or not you would want to make breakfast, a bigger meal or dinner, uh, that would be the question. And I don't necessarily have the answer to that right now, but I can get it for you or try to get it for you. Um, Iris is asking, is it green tea? Roma is not green tea. No, uh, it's made from chicory and, um, looks like, um, barley roasted grains. Um, yeah, Roma doesn't have any caffeine. Um, so yeah, yeah. So I'll get, try to get back to you, Keith, with that answer. All right, guys. Hey, thanks so much for joining. I'm so. No, I know Tom's is not green tea. Um, talking about as a substitute for coffee. Yeah. Yeah, green tea does have caffeine, if that's what you're you're saying. Um, yeah, typically the teas, uh, basically the darker you get, I think the more caffeine content you have as far as black tea goes. Uh, like if you go from white tea to green tea to black tea. Uh, they successively have more caffeine. Oh, oh, okay, okay. I understand the tea question now. Okay, yeah, because you were asking about tea. Um, and I kind of gave you the answer of a coffee alternative, not really a tea um, alternative. There's definitely lots of herbal teas um, you can try. 
I don't know that they are, any of them are similar to coffee if that's what you're looking for, but, um, but, uh, a tea, um, herbal tea alternatives, there's, there's so many out there. There's rooibos, which is a red tea. There's, there's, um, you know, ginger teas, ginger turmeric, there's peppermint tea and, um, chamomile, um, and they all kind of have different, um, um, proposed effects. So there's lots of different ones you can try. Yep. But you're going to try the warm water tomorrow morning. Good for you, Brittany. Way to be. Glad to hear it. And, uh, all right, guys, we're going to, we're going to sign off and, uh, I hope that you guys enjoyed it. Be sure to share with your friends if you think it's worth sharing. And um, that'll be it. Take care, guys.